on that one and continuing the conversation about restaurants, we've got this article, <clears throat> courtesy of the Wall Street Journal. And this article kind of explains why people agree more with the adage that if restaurants aren't cool, there's no reason to go to them. Because I didn't understand this whole hot take. I think I heard it, first of all, from Chris Black on How Long Gone. Then I saw that, um, what you call it, that journalist on Twitter basically saying, if restaurants are cool, it's a red flag. And then I was thinking to myself, hold on, I go to restaurants for the food. I don't go to restaurants because it's cool. It kind of adds to it, don't get me wrong. But the main reason why I go to like a Hawksmoor is because they've got the best steak in, the f in fucking London. And then it also happens to be a cool restaurant. It happens to also be a nice ambiance. blah de blah 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 But I'm not going there primarily because it's known to be the cool, hit place to be. I'm going there for the fucking steaks. But I do understand from the premise, if you're somebody who unlike me, don't actually go to clubs or don't like going to bars, maybe the only way to kind of be around adults in a somewhat clubby, barry environment is a really swanky restaurant. You can spend a bit of money. You can put on some nice clothes. You can hear the best of Griselda, Ethel Kane, Caroline Palaszczuk, Tyler the Creator, um, <clears throat> Robert Glasper, whatever nice, chic tips of music you like playing on the speakers. You can have a good vibe, take a couple of good pictures of the food, get some likes off on your Instagram and have a good time. And also, more importantly, connect with the hip and cool people working there because usually they try their best to you know, hire cool looking people so that it makes it a good place to go. So I can understand that kind of point of it. So this article kind of explains it very, very well and has some incredibly chic images of some really beautiful looking restaurants in the actual article itself. I think the headline one, this is a Matt Abricast new venture, which is called the Golden Swan in Manhattan. That looks fucking beautiful. I love a good restaurant that has a really good bar. Because usually, if I'm not going with one person, I'm usually going by myself to a restaurant. So I love the ability to be able to post up at a bar, have some have some bar food, especially if they've got a different menu for seated at bar menu. Um, be able to order a cocktail, be able to have some powwow with a fucking bartender. Back in the day, if I wanted to get some yayo, I would fucking ask a bartender, hey, where can I score some things? Because usually the entire kitchen is on something, so you can always get something for the guys. Like That has always been one of my kind of draws. If a restaurant has a good bar, I'm fucking there. I'm fucking there. Anyway, the title of the article is, Why Restaurants in Manhattan Are the New Nightclub. It says, in 2006, Matt Abrichek, how to Abram... Abramchik, yeah, Matt Abramchik, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry about that, my throat, um, quit his day job in finance to open his own bar in New York City, West Village. Partnering with graffiti artist Andre Savaria, which is, he's a fucking legend, he's the guy that does those stick figures and whatnot, and DJ Paul Savengi, who might be Chloe Savengi's brother, not too sure, to take over the Beatrice Inn, a former Italian restaurant in the rundown basement that they transform into a clubhouse for their friends. The Beatrice, as it became known to its designs, drew an eclectic mix of young artists, actors, musicians and models. The quote, it was our land of misfit toys. Um, with his instructable gatekeeper, Angelino Bianchi, man in the door, it soon became a hot blight, a hot bite on New York and raging into a wee hours most nights of the week. By the way, I've heard, right, there's restaurants in New York or restaurants in LA, cool ones that put stickers on your phone on your phone cameras, like they do in Bergheim. That's something that I know about nightclubs. Going to many nightclubs, everyone kind of copies the, you know, the premise of like Bergheim and maybe other clubs in the 70s and 80s that especially didn't like people taking pictures on the inside, right? Wanted people's privacy to be respected, wanted it to be like a labyrinth and a playhouse for adults to have fun and to not feel like they're being watched and to kind of express themselves, especially if it comes to, you know, the kind of genesis of that whole scene of it being a safe space for the LGBTQ queer gay community. So you don't want people to see you because maybe you're not comfortable of coming out and blah, 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 blah. So the adage and the the idea and the notion of having a someone put a sticker over your camera lens when you go to a nightclub and telling you hey for once disconnect enjoy i get it but if you dare to stick a fucking sticker on my camera lens in a restaurant so i can't take a fucking picture like this of my burger i'm gonna throw a fit i'm not having it i'm not fucking having it personally i'm really fucking not having it anyway it continues in April 2009, the Beatrice Inn was padlocked by the city by the Department of Building, citing overcrowding and an inadequate means of egress. Ab Abrimic had tackled noise complaints by soundproofing neighboring apartments, but his mitigation efforts weren't enough. 
Imagine having a restaurant where you're getting noise complaints. That's fucking a great, um, a great endorsement of what you're doing. But look at that. Look at that bar. This is the Wallace Room. Look at how great that looks. Woo -hoo -hoo. The Beatrice Space eventually became a clubby restaurant under Chef Angie Ma, though it closed its doors in 2020. Um, Abri, Abri Mick, meanwhile, went on to build a small collection of bars and restaurants further downtown in Tribeca, including Tiny's, Smith's and Mills, and a sports bar called Warren Double Seven. Um, he opened with hockey star Sean Avery, but he always retained a soft spot for the West Village where his career in hospitality began. People keep telling me, or I keep reading, that the restaurant industry is really hard to crack. Restaurants are really hard to crack. It's really hard business to make work. But for some reason, restaurateurs exist. For some reason, these guys and girls who have one, two, three, four, five popping clubs under their fucking tutelage exist. So what's the deal? Are they hard to make work? Or is it if you know, you know, if you get it, you get it. If you work it, you work it. Because I've seen guys and girls who have legitimately a whole slew of restaurants all across fucking town that they operate. So if that's the case and they don't make money, then why are they, why are they doing those things for? I don't buy this. Maybe it's cutthroat. Maybe if it's not good and it doesn't connect with people, you can suffer quite quickly. But also if it's successful, people are going to love it and you're going to be able to make even more and be able to have the access of fucking, you know, venture capital to come in and invest and allow you to build up more because these guys clearly know what they're doing. Look at that. Oof, the exterior of the console looks amazing. This month, Abrimic 44 returns to the neighborhood as a new steward of the Spotted Pig restaurant space, a fixture in the area since 2004. Um, I think the Spotted Pig is the same place that guy from Horses used to be a chef at, I think so. After purchasing the more than century old building from Jay Z's um, SCC Greenwich Re Re Reality, Re Re Reality, says it. Um, his new venture there, the Golden Swan, which anticipated to open in May 24th, is named after the infamous West Village Saloon, fondly known as the Hell Hole, once frequented by playwright Eugene O'Neill and the motley crew of the early 20th century drunks. It was demolished in 1928 to make way for the Sixth Avenue subway. My dream has always been to have like a dive bar, a really crazy, amazing, eclectic, cool dive bar to hang in on. But I guess if you can marry the both, if you're able to have a really delectable, delightful, small menu and also have one of the best bars in the world, you can kind of crush it on both levels. You can be the place where people could come to pre-drink and the place where people can come to have their engagement dinner. It makes complete sense. It continues. With the gut renovation, Abri Mick um, hopes to banish the ghost of the Spotted Pig, New York's original gastro pub, which shut down in 2020. Partner Ken Friedman and the Spotted Pig sell the harassment claims by 11 former employees, which is crazy, with the New York State Attorney General's office for 240000 Chef April Bloomfield, who left the Spotted Pig in 2018, is working on a new restaurant in Brooklyn with restaurateur Gabriel Stoltman who I also recognise the name of as well. Um, it continues here. Every month has erased all vestiges of the building's last tenant, laying down the reclaimed barn wood floors and a black-green Moroccan tile on the walls and removing the Calasio pig, um, the Bele the the Beville establishment and features the Wallace Room, a casual cocktail lounge on the ground floor, and a more elevated dining room. Abramick hopes the second floor dining room will place uh, will be a place where people will know you. He says, and hopefully you'll have a regular table. We're trying to create a clubhouse without being a membership club, which is probably the best way because I feel like some of our best bars and nightclubs here are legitimately. Um, the ones in members clubs but also who wants to go to a members club right that's a little bit lame um, paying a membership to go and drink alcohol somewhere is the antithesis to me of lame so have the ability to go to a cool restaurant be able to be fed correctly is probably the best way to go about things personally but again what do I know Look at the interior there. Oh, looks fucking beautiful. The Golden Swan is a throwback, it says here, to the early aughts when clubby bars and restaurants dominate the night, the downtown city in New York. Lately, across lower Manhattan, nightlife veterans who ran in the same circles back then have opened new spots that channel that insider era, tapping into the nostalgia of recent past that infuses fashion and music. Before this year's Met Gala, Gucci hosted a Bungalow 8 pop-up, reviving Amy Sokoko's celebrity-packed Chelsea nightclub, which closed in 2009 for a night. The new spots reference a time when Gen Z patrons were far too young to drink. Back then, when first iPhones appeared, before Instagram, online reservations, and when access wasn't always about how much you could spend, but who you actually knew. Exactly. And that was the best time, I think, in the flash photography era. Right, that's the time that I'm thinking of where spots will be 
extremely gatekeeping, which would be extremely gatekept by the people that were kind of going to them because they didn't want them to get too bait. It continues here. Before Matt Klingham, 40, and Carlos Quareta, 47, partners of the Authentic Hospitality Group, opened their down, own downtown bars and restaurants. They often partied together at the Beatrice, crowding into the all-out debaucherous back room of the Quareta describes it. That is when they weren't throwing their own rumptuous parties at the Bowery Hotel. Their annual Halloween bash drew thousands eventually and its own corporate sponsors. That's a really good, really good final, isn't it? To be like a club promoter, to owning your own club, then becoming a restaurateur. That might be in my future. Because for now, my long-term plan is to open my own nightclub. For now, my long-term plan is to have my own nightclub. One of the best little 250 to 500 cap nightclub. That's my ultimate goal. And obviously book myself every weekend. But just operate a really cool nightclub and also have it to be a little bit more fun and joyous more of a housey disco vibe as opposed to the gloomy new rock dr martin's all black techno shit that we have going on that's my long-term plan but who knows maybe sometime down the line I open a restaurant maybe it's zingers maybe it's zingers burgers zingers pizzas right where a big black guy cooks you fucking pizza <laughs> the east london way <laughs> <laughs> what's people saying in chat Uche saying me personally I take a nice ass restaurant over a crowded club any day yeah and I think Uche I think you are definitely the majority I think so because I see way more restaurants opening up these days than nightclubs don't get me wrong nightclubs have a lot more regulation around it there's a lot more issues with noise pollution and police and blah 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 I know that but I see way more restaurants opening up all the time even the ones that fail they fail they open up another one they fail again open up another one there's always a chance to open 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 because people more than often I feel like especially adults especially people between the ages of like 25 and 45 would probably much rather go to a restaurant have a bang ass meal have some great cocktails mocktails have great ambience maybe some good music playing there maybe a couple cute guys and girls working they can have some eye candy out to watch at chat to shoot the shit with and go home as opposed to being in a club like i am bungled over some table sharing a key you know of whatever crap that you bought on the dark web i particularly do think that so i definitely think that more people want to do that than that to be honest look at that salad there on top it said in 2009 kellingham worked with the finance group jp morgan and Quirat, um, who worked with the fashion in the, in the Eastern Zone, and leveraged the reputation at the party host to launch their two first ventures. Imagine being a host of parties and also being able to use that to leverage to build restaurants up. Amazing. The Smile in All Day Cafe on Bond Street, that's a great name for actual cafe, to be honest, followed a few minutes later by The Ballroom, their nightclub in the Jane Hotel in the West Village, transforming the ballroom of a former single-room occupancy hotel into a sort of overgrown living room. The quote, We wanted it to feel like you broke into your friend's house through a party without permission and his parents are going to be super pissed. That's a great way to describe a restaurant, isn't it? That's a great bit of copy and PR there. I wonder how much they had to pay for that. That's a good fucking byline. We wanted it to feel like you broke into your friend's house, threw a party without permission, and his parents are going to be super pissed. I love that. It continues. The ballroom at the Jane picked up where the Beatrice left off and drawing the same clientele for a while. They even had a Bianchi outside manning the fucking velvet rope. It continues, the Jane Hotel, which was sold to the Impresario, sorry, Impresario Jeff Klein in December, will soon house the San Vicente West Village, an offshoot of the San Vicente Bungalows. I think that's a place where they cover your phone. Um, his private members club from West Hollywood with a film industry following. Quaret and Klingman shuttered the smile this past summer, reopening the space in February with a third partner, Matt Charles, 37 at Jackson Bond Street, named after Jack Chapelman, a beloved neighbourhood figure who so-called the mayor of Bond Street who lived in the building for decades. And again, look, they've got pool, pool tables there and shit, so cool. The last cocktail bar, which launched um, during New York Fashion Week and hosted parties um, by Rodate and uh, features small plates from the Jeremiah Stone, Fabian von Horsk Valetra and Chef Team behind the Wild Fair and the Contra and the 90s tonality, as designer Christine Gorsh describes the Earth Tones Decor. 
the beige pool table towards the back of the room is reminiscent of a kind of sexy time. The smug, the snug lounge for private events opened in the subterranean wine cellar. The quote here saying, I'm anticipating that it will be more debaucherous and maybe it will have to be because you're going to lower closer to hell. So they're kind of encouraging guys to have adult fun. They're encouraging people to go under the table and take something in their nostrils or their mouths, but also sit down and eat and have a good time. I fucking love that. So big up there says John Nidich, 41. Um, the Impresario behind a string of New York hotspots started going out in downtown in the early 2000s when he was still a freshman at Brown University, take, talking his way into Bungalow 8 before he was could legally drink. I got in one night, kind of luckily, and at the end of the night, talked, ended up making friends with one of the bouncers, he says. While living in the city after graduation, pursuing an acting career, he made the, the Beatrice his usual haunt. Going from acting to restaurateurs is a pretty good pivot, I'm not going to lie. I went there every night for the first few months. I was like, you need to go, show up and become a regular. The dance floor was always packed and always sweaty, and you could smoke and you could drink and you could basically do whatever you want. And I have to admit, my most funnest time especially when i was young was the time when i was fucking out in dawson all the time in shortage all the time specifically this one club called the alibi i fucking lived there you know thursday through to sunday and it was kind of cool and kind of nice to have that be a part of your identity being a regular at a fucking bar and hanging out it would have been a little bit better if they had like little nibbles and snacks that they sold but i think there's some weird laws around alcohol and having food you probably have to have another license but that's something that we don't really have well in most bars there's not a lot of good bars that have good finger foods if you have a bar that sells alcohol you just have to have a full menu for you to sell food you can't have it in between i think so that's why I, I see but i did enjoy the aspect of being a regular or pulling up um seeing regular bartenders knowing what you like to drink drink regular people that hang out there people that sit in a particular seat people that are in a particular area that was all part of the fun of going to those kind of clubs and bars and spaces and i wish i could do that more often but i don't go to bars as much as as i used to because i replaced them with nightclubs but now that i am changing my ways maybe the restaurant and bar scene is something that could replace it adult fun after the beaches closed, Nidris talked to one of his owners about bringing it back. Look at the interior of this place, the nines. Ooh, decadent and amazing, isn't it? Um, I like that all nightclubs, or sorry, all bars and restaurants have this kind of 90s, 20s, 30s decor, as opposed to looking incredibly modern. You don't really get that. I feel like the modern minimalist bars and restaurants, they kind of feel a little bit cold. They don't feel very welcoming and homely. I wonder what it's about that era, 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, that makes people feel instantly at home, especially when most of the people in those places were never born around then. Don't probably have any relatives that were still alive from that era either. But for some reason, we connect way more with that decor than we do with the modern, stark, metal, steel, concrete, exposed brick type of style type of shit. Not sure what that is about. It continues. In 2012, Needich opened his own lounge in a basement below Acme, a restaurant in NoHo that served a new Nordic cuisine. Abimek's younger brother, Jack, a former bartender at the Beatrice, became the resident DJ. Of course, the fucking bartender to DJ funnel is always existing. The Beatrice was such a strong influence. The music specifically says, Needich, I think we were able to create one of those last generals of places where it was safe to be wild. Love that dancing on tables right doing bumps at the fucking dinner table you know swigging your cocktail shouting screaming singing along to the tracks singing along to some smith songs that comes on again love it uh what's up we just saying in the chat there's a really nice place in Cle oh here yeah, zingers beef patties is hilarious in cleveland that used to be a speakeasy in the prohibition era another place who used to be a bank and seats people in a huge vault yeah i love shit like that speakeasy era crazy and intimate yeah for sure maybe that's a good point maybe that's what it harkens back to a time when we were all crazy, a time when people went for it, were a bit wild and nuts, and people want to recover that. Maybe. It continues here. The basement lounge is still open, but these days the real buzz is upstairs in the former Acne restaurant space, now a crystal lit and velvet curtain lounge with a piano, music, and a caviar topped baked potatoes that needed to open earlier last year. It's funny, right? This entire article has everything about the ambience, about the decor, about the vibe they're trying to recreate at this restaurant scene. And then it gets right to the end. 
And then all the pictures also, you know, they've got cool guys standing in front of a bar, um, cool, cool pool table, amazing interior design, amazing furnishing. And it only gets to the bottom, maybe the 10th paragraph down, you finally get pictures of the food. <laughs> it goes to show maybe restaurants, uh, you know, utility nowadays is the coolness factor. The food is secondary. As long as your food's like a five out of 10, maybe even less, people are okay with it. They just want the cool factor more. Anyway, it continues here. Um, with a table hopping regulars, the uh, the place it conjures a time when New York was less of a tether to the electronic devices, back when we weren't in a constant communication to let people know where you're going. You just all you just all went to the same place and knew you were going to see each other. You see a player of fruit there. Uh, it says, um, what does it say here? Aisha Shelley, a 14 native, caught the very beginning of the scene, emerging down just before 9-11, when he spent a few months living in New York with his older brother Noah who worked in fashion there was a bunch of kids moving in here who wanting to make a mark on New York and my brother was one of them though he only returned to New York full-time in 2009 arriving just before the Beatrice closed he wound up eventually working for Abramick as a as his short-lived Soho restaurant Navy like look at that bar oh that looks beautiful casino's lower level bar Look at this exposed steel at the bar counter. These great um, chairs. I also love the fact that most bars, they don't have them a lot here in London for some reason, but I think the addition of having little hangers where you can hang your coat and bags underneath the bar counter is always a great place. And also having enough room behind you that the servers can walk around and people, and you don't feel like you have to kind of be right up against the bar with your knees kind of scraping against it. A good place to kind of rest your feet and shit, chat, chat, whatever. Get a look at the land, mirrored um, walls behind the cocktail so you can see behind you. And it gives you a bit of a feeling of space. Um, look at the the addition of these lights on the wall and decorations add some warmth to it especially because it looks a little bit dark and there's not much natural light coming in there that's a really clever use of space there i love that little room there for sure and again look at the people involved in restaurants right you always got these fucking you always trust a guy that's covered in tattoos and with a big beard what works in restaurants usually they're gonna fucking do you right fat dudes covered in tattoos with beards are never gonna disappoint you when it comes to a restaurant um, maybe you have to you have to maybe not trust somebody that's a super skinny mini it continues just says in 2015 Shelly and his other friends launched their own downtown clubhouse Mr. Fong's on the edge of Chinatown that sounds a little bit like cultural appropriation three white guys launching a restaurant called Mr. Fong's in Chinatown sounds a bit crazy it continues the fashion following that began at the bar has continued as his own costal Italian French restaurant casino which opened last December a few blocks away with its moodish design and there's some um, crowd of table hopping regulars and the vibe of a dining room harks back Shelley says to New York when he first came I want the New York that I remember when I was 19 whatever magic that was we're all just trying to recreate it in our own way that sounds kind of sad but it also makes a lot of sense because this vibe definitely gives it kind of feeling of somebody that's kind of coming in bleary-eyed wide-eyed for the first time in new york and seeing what the hell is going on there so i definitely do understand that anyway the article is hella long I'm not going to read the entire thing i think it's actually finished isn't it? by the time i finish here is it yeah but there's many, many pieces here. This interior here of the Mulberry with this kind of Picasso-esque illustration and drawing um, over on the walls looks fucking beautiful, to be fair. I do love that bit of artwork. It looks like there's some lights behind it or underneath it that kind of make it glow. That's an incredible way to kind of use space. So that looks really beautiful. But overall, I'm liking it. And now I'm kind of convinced about the idea that restaurants utility for the most part, especially in modern culture, are mostly the coolness factor and the food is secondary. Because more than likely, if the food isn't a 5 out of 10, no one's going to come anyway. So why not add an extra bit of panache to it by having it be cool so people can come and communicate and kind of feel like it's a clubhouse, feel like they want to be seen there just for the sake of it. That kind of can increase your longevity and turn it into a whole entire different different place and its function that it serves within your local scene but again what do i know what do i know the article itself is titled what restaurants in manhattan are uh, the, why restaurants in manhattan sorry are the new nightclubs it's available from the wall street journal and the link will be also available in the description if you want to check it 